You're listening to the Fertility Docs Uncensored Podcast, featuring insight on all things fertility from some of the top-rated doctors around America. Whether you're struggling to conceive or just planning for your future family, we're here to guide you every step of the way. Hi, everybody. We're back with another episode of Fertility Docs Uncensored. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Abby Eblen from Nashville Fertility Center, and today I'm joined with my friends, Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center. Hello. And Dr. Carrie Bedient from the Fertility Center of Las Vegas. And, and we are joined today with a special guest, Amy Jones, and she is going to talk a little bit about genetics. But before we get started, we were talking about Amy's favorite hobbies, I guess. And so she told us something really interesting. So a- Amy, tell us what your favorite hobby is or pastime maybe. So this is my current, yeah, my current favorite hobby is um, raising chickens and turkeys. So how did you get into that? <laughs> <laughs> we have so um, many questions. <laughs> yeah. So how did I get into it? And what happens at Thanksgiving? That's really the pre- pressing question. Like, do your turkeys get traumatized when November comes around? I don't take it personally. Okay. (laughs) So I think it started, you know, I grew up on a farm, typical uh, Tennessee girl. But um, my kids wanted to have, you know, baby chicks for Easter. And so we we got baby chicks. And one of my boys, Gilbert, fell in love with them. Like, it's like they call him. And I fell in love with them. And one year they didn't have chickens and so we got turkeys because that's what they had yes there's a lot of turkeys around here i had some turkeys on my front porch the other day i was just showing a picture to everybody of the mama turkey and there was a baby turkey wow we have wild turkeys where we are yes yeah and they well our domestic turkeys bring in the wild turkey so they'll kind of wander oh. up but i have a gobbler now wait, wait, what's it what's a gobbler what's a gobbler is that a boy it's a boy yeah okay a turkey. <laughs> versus a what's a female um, turkey it's an XX. A hen. A hen. A goblet. A goblet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a hen. It's, he's just such a love. He, you know, lets me paint his little toenails. And, um, you paint the toenails of your turkeys? I do. That's hilarious. I do. Um, <laughs> How many follow- do you have? Well, um, let's say we're down to two. How many have you had at most? We've lost a few. <laughs> Coyotes? We had six. Yeah, we had six. And then just kind of disappeared. You know, they just, they go. We have, you know, predators, including dogs. Oh, so, okay. In my random, you know how everybody goes on internet deep dives in random things? So there was something called Duckgate something like that, that was based off some Ivy League university that got a a really phenomenal amount of funding from like an NIH grant on how ducks procreate. And it turns out that um, male ducks are not what you would consider gentle lovers. And so as a result, the female ducks have evolved to make it much trickier for male for, for duck sperm to find the female duck's egg to fertilize her eggs. So as a result, it's essentially a corkscrew-like vagina with a lot of blind ends in order to get to the, the sperm and the egg to actually combine. Um, Carrie, and, can I just interrupt for a second? Yeah. You are a wealth of information. The more I know you, the more I realize you are just, you have the most esoteric facts of anybody I know. It's so interesting talking to you. <laughs> Um, it's give me two glasses of wine and see what pops out wow, of me. Yeah, I can't um, wait to hear that. Two, gla- two glasses of wine and Google scares the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so what I want to know is, do do turkeys have the same type of reproductive re- reproductive system as ducks do? Like, do they have, I, I mean, know. it's a literal corkscrew penis on, on the male duck in order to accommodate the shape of the vagina. And not only that, but they lose it in between seasons and it reduces to like 10% of its overall <laughs> size because it essentially partially regresses. And I, I didn't get too much. Sounds into like that. marriage. <laughs> <laughs> So, wow. 
fiery minds want to know? I don't know. Um, they're not in the same, you know, kingdom phylum class. I believe it's class. They're not in the same class as turkeys. Turkeys are in, um, they're galliforms, they're in gallinaceous. So they're scratchers. Oh. Like scratching for food? Or uh, scratching scratchers like for, chickens. Yeah. Yes. They've scratched up our front lawn. The turkey and the mama that I've just showed you that scratched up our front lawn. Well, that's rude. Ah, yeah, it is rude. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, they can be rude for sure. But I, I, don't, I don't know. So do you just keep turkeys like pets or is there an ultimate end game? Like they're going to be on your Thanksgiving table or? No, there's no end game. I don't raise them to, you know, for meat. They're just to to raise, to be around. And you paint their toenails. Do they come inside the house? Like, can you cuddle in the same way that you can have a a dog cuddle? Can you have a turkey cuddle? (laughs) No. And I have to explain this to my kids. They want to cuddle them because the, the gobbler puffs up. You know, that's what oh, he does. Yeah. He's constantly puffed, so he's real soft looking. Sorry, I'm not supposed to use my hands. Um, so I have to explain to the boys, don't hug him, you know, interact with him, talk to him, and he'll fluff up more, but you can't, you can't hug him. And they're spontaneous defecators, so you can't really, you can bring them inside, but there'll be a, um, we'll have a so- mess. Wow. So I know people how like do you that come too. Up, how do you come up with the idea <laughs> I'm going to paint my turkey's toenails? Well, he walks like he's on the uh, runway. Uh, you know, it's like <laughs> one foot, okay. one foot, one foot. And so I thought, you know what? This deserves something more. Some locker. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. I get yeah. it. I get it. That is so cool. That's so amazing. do the chickens like the turkeys and the turkeys like the chickens? Are they yeah. all in big happy family? No. No. No, I mean, they sort of tolerate each other, but no, they're not, they're, yeah, they're not friends. If you cross a chicken and a turkey, do you get two thirds of a turducken? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know either. I've never I mean, are that. they in the same class? Like, could that theoretically the Same number happen? of chromosomes since we're on that topic today? Yeah. Well, you know what's interesting? We're talking about spontaneous defecators. You know, there are also spontaneous ovulators. And oh. humans are spontaneous ovulators. Whooping cranes are not spontaneous ovulators. They have to be induced to ovulate. How is a whooping crane, how do, you, how do you get ovulation to happen in a whooping crane? Obviously, it happens spontaneously in nature somehow, right? Um, no, they, they have to sort of be in love. They have to have a mate and they have to want to mate. Aww. <clears throat> so, so, so do you also have whooping cranes then too? It's, it's like whooping crane birth control. No, but it's a great story because they were nearly going extinct and there was this one that was really valuable. She was in captivity and she didn't like other whooping cranes. She liked humans. And so they, you know, they tried to get her to, to like all these different guys and she just liked this one guy. So he had to literally move in with her for a month. And um, guy or guy <laughs> whooping crane. Like a human male? A human male, yeah. <laughs> and they would do these dances. Okay. I mean, whooping cranes are huge. And they would do these dances. He, you know, he would have to throw things around. They make a big racket. Um, and she ovulated. And they wow. did the little artificial insemination. And it, it um, worked. Oh and then the, the chick died as it was hatching. Oh. I think we could have a whole podcast on the whooping crane, <laughs> turkey, chicken thing. But unfortunately, <laughs> due to time, we might want to move on to our question of the day. So, <laughs> All right. Sorry. Well, so I, I hate to bring up the fun, <laughs> but Susan's got the question of the day here. Okay. So this question is from one of our listeners. Um, what would you recommend for physicians about to go through IVF, especially those who may still be in training? Who should you tell at work, if anyone, and how should you handle your schedule? Well, I'll let one of you ladies kind of take it off and then I'll give you my, my opinion. So I guess my philosophy is do what you got to do. Tell who you have to tell to make it work. And so, you know, in general, I would say your program director is probably a reasonable person to tell because if anybody's going to get complaints of, you know, so-and-so is not showing up to whatever on time, they're going to be the ones who eventually hear about it. Um, You know, I... Some people are really open about what they're going through. Some people are not. A lot of that depends on where you are. Um, 
in who you are as a person. You know, I would certainly say your your more immediate team, you know, your chief who's ever on with you or your junior if you're the chief probably makes sense because they they're going to be the ones who are covering for you and helping you maneuver the schedule in particular. Um, but I think it really it really depends, you know. And and one thing that I have found is the case is that there are more physicians who have gone through fertility treatments than you will ever imagine. And when I think about my my patient population, I have just about every subspecialty and specialty and general like field of medicine represented. And so odds are pretty good that whomever you're talking to has either been through it, their family member's been through it, they're thinking they might have to go through it. Like there's there's a pretty decent chance that you're going to find some support where you didn't expect it. Um, yeah. And I would just echo that too. I think um, we're close to a major medical center here in Nashville. And I have layers of physicians who are start at the attending level and go down to the fellow level, down to the resident level. And at times we've had to be really careful because we've got people from the same specialty in the office and we're trying to keep them separated. So the fellow doesn't know her attending is also there. And so I I would definitely echo that. There's many, many, many people that are affected by infertility. And when I personally had infertility, I was a new faculty member and, you know, I kind of wanted to keep it under wraps, but I shared it with my, um, you know, with our program director. And I, I think, you know, you'll find that if you share with the right people, I think it'll make your life a lot easier and you'll be a lot less stressed if you, if, if you know, the people that are in charge and that are, um, that, that are involved kind of know about it because then, you know, then they'll understand. And I think, um, you'll just find that people are a lot more um, helpful than you might imagine. Yeah. I mean, the world of who's affected by fertility, it's the world is big. And right now it feels like your world is so small. And and I know that's really hard to like kind of wrap your head around. But I also can say that fertility is hard enough when you're not having to keep it an absolute secret from everybody, it takes a lot. Uh, it takes a whole lot of energy to keep that secret. And if you can focus that energy into something else, um, I, I think nine times out of ten, it, you're you're going to be better off with it. But you you do need to talk to somebody. You do need to share it. Like I said, uh, like Carrie said, probably with your program director at the very least. Or and your assistant your, program director, if they're a little bit more user friendly to the topic, you know. Yeah, but I, I mean, and they'll also help you figure out who who else you might need to talk to. So um, to to make that transition um, work, because obviously you're going to have some times you're going to need to take off, and there's going to be some times that you can't really control exactly when that is, and and that's hard in training. That's really hard in training. So we get that. We get that. So we, I hope I hope we were able to kind of answer that question. So so I would like to in- officially introduce our guest, um, who is also, you know, in charge of chickens and turkeys and um, other animals. But her main job is to work for Ovation Fertility. And she is in charge and has been in charge at National Fertility for many years um, of our um, program to analyze embryos genetically, and she does. She's she's our genetic guru. So, Amy, tell us what your official title is with Ovation Fertility. Scientific director of genetics. Scientific director of genetics. And so, what do you do on a daily basis? <laughs> it's changed over the years, hasn't it? Um, so, I do a lot of administrative, actually, and operations work in terms of. Um, making the process smooth for patients and for clients, um, improving our policies, our calling policies, troubleshooting, um, talking to patients. I talk to patients from time to time, but mostly I'm talking to um, physicians and, and sometimes nurses. So with your expertise today, we're going to talk about lifestyle and its impact on chromosomal abnormalities. And this was a topic that you chose, um, which is, I'm sure, near and dear to your heart. So tell us kind of why you chose this topic and lead us in the direction we need to go today. Yeah. So you might remember um, when I was at NFC, I met with every couple going through IVF if they were interested in PGT. And so I would talk to them before and after 
their cycle. And so tell me what PGT is. Pre-implantation genetic testing for is- aneuploidy or testing the embryos for chromosomal abnormalities prior to transferring the embryos into, um, into the uterine environment. So I would meet with patients and, um, you know, one of the questions would be after we would explain the rates of chromosomal abnormalities in particularly women of certain ages, they would say, well, I'm healthy, I eat organic food, I run, and, you know, as we know, it, it doesn't, unfortunately, that doesn't have much of an impact. So, so Amy, what does have the most impact in the those chromosomal abnormality rates? So, I would say age. Well, of course, age of the of the female. That's the number one. So, impacts. And what age? What age is really the age you have to be concerned about chromosomal abnormalities? Thirty-five and older. So, what in in kind of real world examples? What what is that? mean? Like, I think we all interpret chromosomal abnormalities as being too many or too few chromosomes and and humans are very particular. You need 46, no more, no less. And if you have too many or too few, you have a problem, whether that is Down syndrome, negative pregnancy test, miscarriage, whatever. But when you're communicating to a couple, okay, you are you know, 35 years old versus if you were to wait five years and be 40 years old versus if you were to wait another five years and be 45 years old, what's the difference incrementally between your 30-year-old all the way up to your 45-year-old? The difference in terms of the number of... uh... Yeah, in terms of abnormalities. Like what does that really mean for a woman who's going to have a baby of... How many, how many of her embryos are going to be abnormal just solely because of age? Yeah, so starting off and you're, you know, we break it down into age groups. So less than 35, we see about 60% of the embryos are chromosomally normal. Um, when you get to over 40... So, hey, stop there for just a second, because I think that's the concept that is really hard for people to understand. Like even in a 24-year-old... Yeah, If I was 24 and I had all these eggs, so what you're really saying, a 24-year-old, 40% of her embryos that she creates would be genetically abnormal, correct? Correct. correct. I still find that mind-blowing. <laughs> I know. And it's, you know, it's always shocking when you have a, a young egg donor produce all abnormals. That has happened. Now, of course, there's the paternal contribution but or the sperm contribution, but um, yeah, you just can't predict it. Can't judge a book by its cover or age. So if you've got someone who is 35 years old or 40 years old, what percentage are they looking at of likely abnormals? So, you know, it's it stays pretty steady to 37, so 50, 60%. But then when you get to 38, 39, you're looking around 40%, then it reduces to about... 20 to 30, and then, you know, it diminishes from there. Um, those are averages. So, so they're so outliers, we have, of course, in all those groups. So, Amy, in, in our clinic, I mean, generally, I, you know, people come in, they're like, am I too old? And, and you know, I am like, too old is like, the term just doesn't even work for me. Okay. Now, people who start making me nervous... Um, on whether or not we're going to be able to get those chromosomally normal embryos, especially when they start getting to be 43, 44, 45. Um, because as we all know, people are pushing out childbearing later and later. What, what are the chances when you're nearing those mid-40s of having a chromosomally normal embryo? Very low. Freeze your eggs, folks. So very low, like maybe... Less than 5%. Okay. And yeah. another more specific question, you may or, not, may or may not be able to answer this, but what is the oldest patient that has gone through, had genetically normal embryos, and has gone on to have a live-born baby? I think, oh gosh, I don't know. I, I think 46 might be. I think that sounds right. I know we had somebody, and this was a couple of years ago, who was 46, who went through, and we were all I think in Nashville, the oldest patient I can recall was 44 when she, when we had embryo, when we made her embryos and she was 45 when she actually delivered. That's the mm-hmm. oldest patient I remember. 
Yeah. And of course, it's the age of the, the egg that matters, not right. the age in which you have the, the embryo transferred. So if you have, so it sounds like under, under 35, you're expecting about 60% of the embryos to be genetically normal. By the time you hit 37, you're still in that 50, 60% range, 37 to 40, you start to drop down into the 40% range. And then by the time you hit 41, 42, 41 is like really that's critical. 41, you're starting to hit down 20%. And then by the time you're 43 and older, you're in single digits. Is that a fair assessment? Should I tweak those numbers? I would say at 40, you're at 20%. And then at above 40, that's when it really starts declining. So the, the question really is, is there anything that you can do that doesn't involve genetics, is there anything you can eat or any pill you can take or any supplement that will change your outcome? So <laughs> short answer is you can't, from, from what the data shows, we're not necessarily going to improve, um, and there's not a lot of data, any poly rates, but you can, according to some recent research, make things worse. Um, mm according to your lifestyle. And so, okay, so you know, we may not be able to make it better, but we can make <laughs> things worse. <laughs> yeah, so you, you should, one should take these things into account. Um, you know, when we talk about percentages of normals, you also have to remember that the number of eggs that we are able to uh, retrieve or collect diminishes as the patient gets older. So you have to take that into account. So maybe it's, you know, 60% of, 10 when you're 35, but it's 60% of three or two when you're 37, 38. So um, when, when you go through IVF, and I think this is important for, uh, for patients to understand, if you have your embryos tested and you have one that's, that's normal and you transfer that one and it works, that's great, but you're going to be a year older or more before you can go through again. So it's good to go ahead and, and um, if you want to store embryos for siblings later, it's better to do it now as opposed to wait, waiting because those numbers will diminish as you get older. So what lifestyle things make it worse? Like lifestyle what, things. What so, habits should you either not pick up or drop to improve I mean, your odds? Smoking is, is bad um, for sperm, but... Um, is smoking also, bad for eggs too? Sorry for interrupting. Well, uh, I don't think there's been a direct correlation between smoking and, and euploidy, but um, there has been uh, there have been studies that have shown that smoking impacts egg quality or embryo quality. So, yeah, but, I will just say anecdotally, when I see a smoker, generally if she's 37 or older, you can almost bet her egg number is going to be low. Now, it may not affect her her genetics but her egg number may be lower. And there, you know, there's data to show that women who smoke go through menopause earlier. So we know that it does damage to the eggs themselves, the number of eggs, maybe not necessarily the genetics, but certainly if you're dealing with a lower number, that's an issue. Yeah. I'd also, I'd also like to make the point that when we talk about smoking, we're actually talking about any type of nicotine use. So whether you're vaping or it's in a patch or a pill or a gum or through a good old fashioned cigarette, it's, it's all the same when it comes to us. Okay. So, you know, one thing that I, I try to explain to my patients is you know, smoking makes your ovaries age faster than you do. We're, we're born with all the eggs we're ever going to get. So, you know, we don't need anything speeding up the process. But while we're actively smoking, there's a byproduct of nicotine called cottonine that actually ends up in the fluid that's bathing our eggs. So you're essentially bathing your eggs in nicotine. It doesn't sound like oh. such a great idea. So, no. and, and the cool thing about it though, is if you stop smoking that stuff goes away from your follicular fluid, the fluid that's surrounding your eggs. So you can have a positive impact. Just like Amy said, we're, we're not necessarily going to make it better, but at least we can like chop the, the downhill slide that, that nicotine's having on our eggs. Yeah. Is there any, any information about environmental pollution? Yeah, so um, I'm sure you guys have heard of phthalates. What are, what are those? Yay. Um, 
Well, there are chemicals that are in just about everything that's around us. And they Mainly in plastics? Like plastics, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Plastics, canned goods, um, receipts. Receipts are really bad. Oh, yeah. Right. The thermal, uh, the thermal yeah, receipts. Yeah, like the, the paper ones that kind of get off on your fingers. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, uh, you know, it's funny because for a while I was really, you know, I was doing yoga and trying to not touch receipts. <laughs> 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 uh, it's hard to do, though. Now it's easier because people aren't exchanging things like that due to COVID. But um, aren't, that, aren't they also like in perfumes too? Or am I wrong about that? Probably. Some, some chemical. I mean, they go, go through hmm. a tube and Yeah. So do you think it makes a difference to switch out all your Tupperware to glass? Yes. Oh, I do. I, I don't put anything in Tupperware. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, yeah. so what, what, what does phthalates do? So they, do they affect chromosomal normality or just quality they of do. eggs? So, what, do you, what do you know about this? Outside of, you know, the human studies, um, phthalates have been shown to disrupt meiosis. And so what is meiosis? Meiosis, that's the cell division that occurs in eggs and sperm that um, can ultimately lead to a normal or an abnormal embryo. And if that is disrupted, then obviously that could impact, um, you know, one's fertility. So sperm as well as eggs, you're saying? Mm-hmm. So how much impact does, does sperm quality have on chromosomal number in an embryo? I mean, does it have the same age dependency that it does in women? No. No, it does not. Um, but bisphenol A or bisphenol S, they move from bisphenol A to S, has been shown to affect sperm morphology. Which is shape of sperm. The shape of the sperm. And we know that the, the centrosome comes from the sperm in humans. So that's the, the um, organelle that creates the structure of the egg the embryo, not the egg, of the embryos after fertilization. Huh. And if that is not, um, if that's abnormal, that's one of the components that they look at in a semen analysis is the, the mid piece, which contains the centrosome. So the shape of the egg you're saying comes from the sperm? Uh, the structure of the embryo. Yeah. So huh. in, in structure, are you talking about like the formation of? The spindles. Okay. The spindle apparatus. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying that if Hugh Hefner is 98 years old and he's not smoking, his age <laughs> isn't going to have an impact. And as long as he's eating his food out of glass and not Tupperware, he is not going I'll to have receipts and, and handling, handling, receipts. handling receipts. Which I mean, <laughs> Hugh Hefner off. Obviously, he's not handling his own receipts. Um, he should be okay and would not be contributing additionally to aneuploidy or abnormal chromosome number within embryos that he would create, which of course he would not create because he's not that kind of guy. But, uh, but if he was, he would be okay. Well, I think there's a soft cutoff around 50 for men. There could be an impact of, in terms of paternal contribution to aneuploidy, but it's still it's minimal. Um, the sperm contribution is minimal to and you put in embryos. But if you have an abnormal centrosome, then while uh, the egg might be fine, the embryo might be disorganized. And that could lead to mosaicism. So, so what, what is mosaicism, Amy? <laughs> and please give me an easy blurb that I can tell my patients because I have still to figure out an easy way to explain this to someone else that doesn't involve a ton of pictures and background and all of it. So hit me with your best shot because I need this. <laughs> some cells are normal, some cells are abnormal. So and make up the wait. embryo, correct? Yeah. So, so for our listeners, a mosaic embryo, some, like Amy said, some, are, some of the cells are normal, some of them are abnormal. But what we know is that some of these mosaic embryos can go on to make completely normal babies. So mosaicism in an embryo does not necessarily depending on which chromosome it is and how much mosaicism there is, lead to a baby with a chromosomal abnormality like Down syndrome or something like that. Correct. So Amy, do you grade embryos or look at embryos based on the percent of cells that you think are abnormal versus the percent that are normal? Does that make a difference for you in the lab? So um, 
It does in terms of you guys deciding whether or not to advocate for transferring a mosaic. So if you have a low level of mosaicism, which would be depending on how you grade it, anywhere from uh, 20 to 40 or 30 to 50 percent. Um, and then a high level would be 50 to 70 or some groups um, grade them as 40 to 70. Amy, would so you think level, that it, sorry, do you, do you think that high levels and low levels of mosaicism supersede which chromosome or do you think it's more important to know which chromosome it is? No, it's the higher low is more impactful. The data shows. Okay. Hmm. So Amy, uh, we don't have too, too much time left. Is there anything else from a lifestyle standpoint that you would recommend that our listeners try and avoid or do differently? <laughs> don't microwave your, um, your prepackaged food. Hmm. Put it in something else because that, you know, the little plastic thing that goes over the top, it just drips down those chemicals onto your food. <laughs> Carrie's grabbing her forehead and Susan's got a funny smirk on her face. We're like, oh my gosh, this is going to change the way we do everything. Uh, I think I, I knew a lot of this. Like I had read, you know, several of these articles and I think I had, had chosen to kind of ignore that in terms of my personal life. Head in sand, yes. Yeah, Head in I, sand. I don't, ever, I don't ever heat anything up if it's not in glass. I, I actually do that even though I'm no longer trying to have children, but you know, I, I've, I've read that before and that's been, a, that data has been around for quite some time, I think. Yeah. It's yeah. probably bad for other cells other than just egg and sperm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cause clearly I'm not trying to <laughs> have another child. Are there any other big obvious things that we should be telling our patients? I mean, do you think that eating organic water, eating organic foods that have not had pesticides, do you think those things make a functional difference or... Or not, because those are expensive things to do and time consuming and, and tough. I mean, if you're if you're looking at stopping smoking and switching all of your Tupperware over and no instant foods that are you're heating up in packages, like there's some there's some stress associated with those changes. Do you think the other other things are important as well? So have you heard of the dirty dozen? Uh-huh. I would say, I don't know that this has been correlated with annuity. Um, or with chromosomal abnormalities, but I think it's worthwhile to avoid um, or try to, to eat those in organic form. So those are the, Bananas, the fruits and vegetables potatoes, yeah. that are most likely to absorb the pesticides. So, so which ones, just does. off the top of your head, are, are these, just to name a few? Strawberries, potatoes, um, bananas, um, I mean, I think berries in general. It's Maybe all the things without a thick rind, oh, right? Banana. Yeah. banana. I know bananas are okay, but they're not. I think bananas are on the list now. Oh, okay. Oh. Because I don't really like organic bananas for some reason. They, it seems like they're different. They, they <laughs> turn brown faster, not like a green banana. They don't have all those preservatives that the other bananas have, I guess. Google, yeah, <laughs> Google the dirty dozen. Maybe bananas aren't in there, but I, I Hey, I have a question. Bananas. I have a, a question about chromosomes. So, and this happens, unfortunately, all too often that I'll have a patient who may be 37, 38, goes through IVF, even gets two or three really nice appearing embryos to test and we test them and they're all genetically abnormal. So when we're having an IVF consult after that, I really have a hard time counseling them about what to do. And what I will tell them is, and you tell me if I'm correct or not, you know, we don't know a lot about antioxidants, but I counsel them about trying to increase their, the amount of antioxidants they get. Uh, most of our patients already, or at least my patients are on coenzyme Q10 and there's some suggestion that maybe that might help with cell division and help with, you know, making the embryo genetically normal. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's warranted or not? Uh, yeah, I think that you have to, um, I think we have to try everything. And if it, if it reduces stress, they feel like they're doing something. Because I, I've found that patients, they want to know what they can do. They, they need something to grab onto some, you know, they need the reins a little bit because they have to relinquish so much of their of control over their fertility. Um, so I think it, I think that it's certainly worthwhile. 
I do think stress is, um, has a huge impact. Um, having worked with chimpanzees years and years ago, um, we, and I really, you know, I hate to even talk about it because I'm such an animal activist now, but when we would separate them from their um, groups, they would get really stressed out and there's cortisol levels would go through the roof. And so, yeah, you have a question? No, I was just telling everybody, it's, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up in just a minute. But keep going with your chimpan- chimpanzee story. Okay. <laughs> so their cortisol levels went through the roof, and then what else happened? Right. And so that they, de- they don't respond to the gonadotropins, to the simulation drugs that we were giving them to try. To, at that time, we called it superovulation, to superovulate, to get them to recruit a bunch of eggs. Um, when we trained them to take the injections, because we separated them so we could give them injections. When we trained them to take the injections in their cages or in their enclosures with their families, you know, we, they, give us, they give us their hip, we give them a banana, um, <laughs> they would do much better. And I, I mean, I think that the same goes for people. I think that you really do have to manage your stress when you're going through, um, through IVF. You have to advocate for yourself or let go of the brain. So what you're really saying is coenzyme Q10 just makes me and my patient feel better and probably doesn't do anything to the aneuploid. No, I think it does. Oh, I okay. It does. Good. I just want to make sure. <laughs> want to make sure. Well, Amy, we really appreciate you being here with us today. You have a vast knowledge that, um, that most of us don't have, and we really appreciate you being here. Are there any final words that you'd like to say or any, any final recommendations for our listeners? Um, make a decision. Like if you're considering, uh, doing IVF or doing something towards your fertility, not making a decision is a decision. So make a a conscious decision. I have to freezing Sooner sooner rather than later, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. 41 is better than 42. That is correct. That is true. Well, thank you so much for being here. And so to our audience, I'd like to say thanks for listening and tune in next week for more. Also, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes. We'd really love to hear from you. You can also visit, Fert- you can also visit FertilityDocsUncensored.com to schedule an appointment with any of us or submit specific questions you have about your personal infertility journey. All questions will be answered on the podcast anonymously in our Ask the Doc segment, so don't hold back. We really want to help answer all your questions. All right. We'll talk to y'all soon. And thank you so much, Dr. Jones. We'll see you next week. Bye guys. Bye.